Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on easing the SOLIDWORKS to CATIA transition. In this webinar, we will go over some tips and tricks for new users to help adopt the CATIA software more easily. A little bit about me. I am a senior application engineer with Go Engineer, based out of Denver, Colorado. I graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 2014 with a degree in mechanical engineering and material science. Since then, I have been focusing on all things CATIA related, both in V5 as well as 3D experience. I've worked extensively in design engineering, specifically around sheet metal parts using surfacing, as well as designing injection molded parts using solid part design. During this webinar, I encourage everyone to ask as many questions as they'd like. We have a questions box as part of our webinar interface, so if you'd like to put your questions in there, I plan on saving some time at the end to go over those. However, you are more than welcome to follow up by emailing me. Now, coming from SOLIDWORKS, there's a common misconception that because the software is made by the same company, Dassault Systems, that they'll be similar in nature. However, users quickly realize that this is not the case and become frustrated in the process. I've delivered enough CATIA training that I've been able to compile a list of, quote unquote, the most popular pain points that these users have expressed. Today, we will be covering topics regarding the CATIA V5 interface, sketching, solid part design, and assembly design. Now, this is not a complete list by any means, so if there are some pain points that you would like for me to cover, once again, please ask in the question box or follow up with an email. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, so you can reference uh, this at any time later on. With that being said, let's get started. So here we see both of our interfaces, CATIA V5 on the left and SOLIDWORKS on the right. And if you've ever taken any SOLIDWORKS fundamentals course, you'll easily recognize this U-joint assembly here that we have. And first, looking at the differences in interfaces, I'm gonna start with the design tree or our assembly tree. So looking at an assembly view, SOLIDWORKS, we have our root assembly, we have our sub-assemblies, and then our base parts. And as we expand our base parts, we immediately have our design tree and our design features. Now, CATIA is similar in the sense that we have our root assembly, our sub-assemblies, as well as our part level. However, you'll notice that beneath our part level, we have a whole nother level that actually contains our design tree and our part features. This is what's known as the 3D shape. And this is what you have to activate in order to actually set and build your parts. Now, the reason, the main reason why they kind of set this extra node here is they allow for the part level to contain your part metadata, such as your, your part number and anything that goes into the bill of materials, where the 3D shape is going to contain your geometry. And this allows you to, uh, using manage representations, for example, this allows me to change out my 3D shape without affecting the part number. So I can add in variance. So if I go and activate this 3D shape, we notice that crank knob is changed to crank knob two, but the part level has remained the same. Now, in SOLIDWORKS to navigate your workbenches, if we start out in an assembly view, we see all of our assembly features up at the top here, and then subsequent features in these tabs. CATIA works a little bit different in this regard. If we start out in assembly view, we have uh, just our assembly-based commands. Right now we're in product structure design, so if we take a look at the top right of our interface, we'll have this little icon that will tell us which workbench we're in. And if we wanted to switch over to a different workbench, I can go to start, and let's say I wanna to go to assembly design. I go to mechanical design, and then hit assembly design. And we'll see my icons have changed, and now I have assembly design-based features in my tree. In SOLIDWORKS, if you wanted to go and edit a part, you would highlight the part and hit edit component, and we'll see that our assembly features have swapped over to part design-based features. In CATIA, we have to either right click and say edit, or we could simply double click the 3D shape. 
and making sure you click the 3D shape. So once I double click the 3D shape and activate it, we see it's highlighted in orange. And at the top right, we, are not, we can see we are now in park design and we have park design based features. If I wanted to switch over to, let's say surface design, we would wanna switch over to a surface design workbench. For, based off of the license that I have right now, the workbench is generative shape design. So if I wanna switch over to that, with my 3D shape active, I would go to start, shape, and then generative shape design. And we see it swaps over. Now just as a note, as I mentioned, um, you wanna make sure that you have your 3D shape selected. So if I double click my part level, we'll actually notice that Katia thinks we, are, we need to be in assembly design for this. So make sure if you're editing your geometry, you're double clicking your 3D shape once again. And another note on that, uh, Katia remembers the last workbench that you were in. So let's say if I go and try to edit a different 3D shape now, we're defaulted back into our generative shape design workbench. So if I want to go back to part design, I'll go to start mechanical design and then select part design to get back to my solid design features. And within any workbench, you have the option to move around your work, your toolbars. And you know you have different toolbars or they're set, your toolbars are separated by little gray bars in between them. And if I grab one of those gray bars, I can actually move my toolbar and place it within my 3D or dock it kind of anywhere on the sides here. Now, once you're in a workbench, you don't automatically have all of your toolbars available to you. Uh, you can toggle on and off which ones are visible. And the way that you do that is you find just any you find just any free gray space and you would just right click and then you would activate a workbench. Now, right now, or a toolbar, sorry. And right now we can see that, you know, I activated Boolean operations, but we didn't see anything pop up. So if you take a look down at the bottom uh, corners of the gray bars, you might notice a double chevron arrow. Now in this recording, you may not be able to see it, but if you have your interface open, you, you can definitely notice it and that means there are some toolbars kind of hanging out in the background or docked out of view in order to expose those we would just grab that gray bar again and kind of move our toolbars wherever we want them to be and we notice that as we move them we see more pop up and here are my boolean commands and you would just kind of move your toolbars around until the, that double chevron goes away and then you know you have you're seeing all of your toolbars and to deactivate, so once again, this is our Boolean operations. If I want to deactivate it, I would just go and right-click in gray space and deactivate it there. So one feature that I like to show uh, users when I'm doing training is the status bar. So oftentimes in Katia, users will find themselves kind of in a weird area where they don't know what to do next. And Katia doesn't necessarily help them. So the status bar is simply this string of text that we see at the bottom here. And what it essentially does is it's basically Katia telling you what it's expecting you to do next. So as an example, let's say I wanted to insert uh, an existing component inside my root assembly. I went up to, and the way I do this is I go up to insert and select existing component. Now we'll see once I click this, we get a spinning wheel as well as uh, we'll see the interface kind of flicker a little bit. But once that's done, essentially nothing happens. We don't get a pop-up window, we don't get a prompt, and usually users are kind of confused by this point. They think that the software's broken. But if we go down and check in our status bar, it's actually telling us we need to, at this point, select which assembly we want to insert our component into. So we'll see once I select an assembly, we'll see that my, my Windows Explorer has popped up and it gives me the options to insert whichever part I need. So with that note, if you're ever lost within Katia, I'm not sure what to do next, try checking the status bar and it might give you kind of some direction there. Next, we're gonna take a look at manipulating your data. 
So when I say manipulate, I mean with your mouse. So your pan, zoom, and rotate. In SolidWorks, it's very centric on your roller button or your center button. So on your mouse, you have that scroll wheel. If you click that down, you can you know, effectively move around your part. SolidWorks uses this center button, I'm gonna call it, in conjunction with your keyboard. So holding down control and your center button will pan, shift and center button will zoom, and center button alone will rotate. Now, Katia works similar in this sense that it does use the center button, but it doesn't use the keyboard. It uses your center click button as well as the right click button on your mouse. So starting off with the center click, if you were to just, and Katia, if you just click and release, that's going to center up the part on wherever you clicked on your center click. And this will now be your center for zoom and rotate. So in order to pan, we can just hold down our center click. And as it's held down, we can move our, our mouse around and it'll move the part accordingly. To zoom, I'm gonna start with centering up my part on where I want to zoom. Now, this is not required, but it's a good best practice so you know where you're zooming into. So in order to zoom, I'm gonna first center up my part and then hold down my uh, center click and then click and release my right click. And once I do that, we see my cursor has changed and I can zoom in and out by moving my mouse up and down respectively. And then rotate, I'm gonna follow this, a similar workflow. I'm gonna center up on this pin and then I'm going to simultaneously hold down my center click and then my right click. And with them both held down, I can now rotate about that center. Now, this does take a bit of a learning curve and so some users will adopt the 3D connection mouse, which is fine. And you can use that in conjunction with the mouse commands. And the nice thing about the 3D connection space mouses is they're fully compatible with Katia V5. And you can set hotkeys, adjust your inputs, as well as use the internal software to invert your directions, as well as the sensitivity on the space mouse. You also have the option down here in your view toolbar. This is available in every workbench. And you have your basic commands within here, such as fit all in, pan, rotate, zoom. You can view normal to a surface or a plane. And you can also toggle between your base directions. So ISO, front, back, left, right, etc. And finally, I'll draw your attention to this little widget up here at the top. This is called either the compass or the robot, depending on you know when you were taught Katia and what Katia you're using now. But this, in a sense, will tell us first our base X, Y, Z directions, depending on you know the context. Right now, this is the X, Y, and Z of our of our root assembly, and we see that it moves around as I move the part. However, I can grab features on this. Say I grab the X axis. If I grab this X axis here, I can pan or translate over on the x-axis. Grabbing the zx plane will allow me to pan on that plane. And then grabbing this arc here allows me to rotate about the y-axis. And one thing users might notice while they're panning and zooming their part and manipulating it around is they might find themselves in a scenario where they are trying to pan and zoom and instead of doing that to your part, it's actually doing that to your tree instead. And also on top of that, you notice that you have kind of a shadowy overlay on your parts. In this scenario, you are in what's called tree design mode. And this allows you to do exactly what the title says is, you know, it allows you to reposition your tree and resize your tree. And the way that you toggle this is you just need to click any of these white bars in between your nodes. So we'll see when I click there, everything comes back to normal and I'm moving my part accordingly. So likely you'll find yourself in this scenario if you're trying to expand or collapse a node and you just miss. So keep an eye out for that. So now we're gonna hop over into some sketch-based functionalities. So similar to SOLIDWORKS, you know, if you want to enter your Sketcher workbench, it's a separate workbench than the rest of your data, uh, you would either 
create a new sketch or modify a current sketch by once again, either going to right click, edit, or double clicking the, ske the sketch. Notice when I double click it, our view has spun normal to our sketch. And we notice a grid here. And also on the top right, we see our icon is showing us we are in the Sketcher workbench. And we also see directly below that icon is another icon, a little square box with a vertical arrow. This is how we exit our workbench. So when you're done with your sketch, you just go find where, you typically go up to the top right where it's placed out of the box, and you choose select exit workbench. And the toolbar is just called workbench. So setting some constraints, we can set constraints first dimensionally by going to our constraint toolbar and choosing a constraint option. Then we can go and set that constraint on a geometry. And we'll notice once I set the position of this dimension, unlike SOLIDWORKS, we don't automatically, we're not automatically prompted to edit that input. We have to double click our dimension in order to get our rich box here that allows us to input our dimension. And if you're dealing with any circular geometry, here is where you'll also toggle between radius and diameter. Now taking a look at uh, geometric constraints, we'll add this line in here. And in order to get to our geometric constraints, we have to use this constraints defined in dialog box. Now this is only active and only available when you have your geometry pre-selected. So notice when I click off into space, this box is grayed out. And when I highlight it, I can then select it. We'll see we're given this dialog box and it gives us a certain set of constraints that we can apply based off of the context of what we've chosen. And also note, we can add a length constraint or dimension in here. And notice when I pre-select the line and the circle using my control key to multi-select, we can see we're now given an extra set of constraints based off of the context of these two geometries. So here I can now set tangency. One thing that uh, tripped users up a little bit or kind of frustrates them is out of the box, you are <clears throat> constrained to have snap to point on. So notice when I try to set the end point of this line here, that I can only set it between the intersections of my grid. Now there are a few ways to get around this. There is an option uh, within your sketch tools to toggle the, uh, the point, the snap to point. You can also go to tools, options, and underneath, Underneath mechanical design, sketcher, we can toggle snap to point here and that'll turn it off permanently. However, the way that I suggest to do it is <clears throat> you can leave that on entirely and you could just hold down the shift key. And as the shift key is held down, you are unsnapped from that grid. You no longer have to set those points in between those nodes. And just as a note, this extends to every workbench that requires you to work in a grid. So let's say your 2D drafting workbench, that also snaps you to a grid and also holding down shift will allow you to unsnap from that grid as long as the shift key is held down. And another thing that users will notice as a difference between SOLIDWORKS and CATIA is uh, when you're setting lines, it's only one and done kind of deal. You can't just keep continuously go and set more and more lines to create a, a profile. In order to do that, to create a profile, there's actually a profile command. And this will allow you to create continuous points. And there is a toolbar, your sketch tools here. And this will allow you to, by, switch, by selecting these icons, you can change between tangent arc and non-tangent arc. Whereas in SOLIDWORKS, you just go back to the point and it toggles for you. Here you have to physically uh, toggle them. One thing I also will note is 
instead of going, you know, clicking, creating a line, going back, clicking the command again, creating a line, you can persist your commands by double clicking them. So here I've double clicked line, and now I can create line after line after line without having to go back and select that command. And I can exit it by selecting another command or hitting the escape key. And just like that uh, snap to grid feature, this double clicking to persist your command, this extends to essentially almost every command in every workbench. So if you wanna repeat a bunch of holes in a row or a bunch of pads, you just double click that command and it'll persist until you exit, hit escape, or choose a different command. Now here we're going to exit the sketcher. We're gonna take a quick look at some, uh, how the pad command interacts with sketch profiles. So here we could select our pad command, and this is in our sketch base features toolbar. And notice when I select pad, unlike SolidWorks, I can't select any of my profiles independent of the rest of the sketch. I can only select the entire thing as a whole. So there's two ways to kind of not get around this, but essentially get the functionality that you do in SolidWorks. So within pad, I can go to multi-pad. So notice there's a bunch of icons that have a black arrow below them. This means they have a flyout that contains commands similar to that command. So here we have drafted filleted pad and then multi-pad. If I select multi-pad and then select our sketch, we have the option to apply thicknesses to all my to any closed geometry independent of the entire sketch. The other option is to go into the sketcher workbench by once again double clicking our sketch to edit. And then using our tools toolbar, there's an icon called multi-profile feature. And selecting this will allow us to select which profiles we want to make independent of the rest of the sketch with the option to select all of them. So now that I've selected that command, we'll drop out of the sketcher workbench. And then I'm gonna go back to my regular pad command. And notice, kind of just like uh, the context of my workbenches, uh, the context of my flyout, it remembers the last command that I've chosen. So uh, last time the regular pad command was at the forward facing position of this flyout. Now it's multi-pad because I've selected that last. So to get back to pad, I just go to that flyout and then select pad. And now we'll see, I can go and select these geometries or these profiles independent of the rest of the sketch. Let's see, let's extend this one. So in SolidWorks, there's a feature called rollback, and this allows you to essentially go back in time or up your tree and insert commands below uh, what you've defined as uh, your rollback feature. If you want to edit somewhere than just the bottom of your tree, you can use rollback. And Katia has a similar command. However, it's called something completely different, and it um, you activate it differently. We'll go back to our U-joint assembly, and we're going to find this geometry of my crank knob within my tree. And a nice little trick is you can right-click your uh, part in 3D and say center graph, and it'll center graph up to that command or that feature within your tree. So if I wanted to quote unquote roll back to this pocket one here, I would highlight the part, right click. First, I need to make sure that I'm in my part design context. So I'm going to double click my 3D shape and then right click that feature and say define in work object. And once I do that, we notice a few things. One is that it has indeed rolled back to that feature and two, our pocket.1 is now underlined. So 
whatever feature is underlined, that's going to be your the feature that you have rolled back to. And we'll see that if I say create a hole, we'll see that that feature is now inserted below that pocket and above my edge fillet dot two. And also notice that this new command is now my defined in work object. And to get back to current, you either do define in work object on the last feature within your part body, or you can do define in work object at the top of the part body, and it works exactly the same. So looking at some assembly features now, as you bring in parts into both SOLIDWORKS and CATIA, the parts don't necessarily get, obviously they won't get placed in their assembly position. However, you do want to kind of move them roughly where they're supposed to go so that when you set your assembly constraints, you don't have any unexpected outcomes or orientations. Now SOLIDWORKS, you have the ability to just drag your parts and it'll drag uh, parallel to your viewing plane. However, in CATIA, we don't have that option. As we grab our parts, nothing moves. That's because you have to you have to define it a little bit more. And you have to define kind of what parts you're moving and what direction they're moving. So using our move toolbar, we have some options to do that. One being manipulate, and the other being snap. And in manipulate, you have the option to move your data in your uh, assembly, your, your root directions, or across your, uh, pan them across your base planes, or rotate them about your base axes. And notice that if I rotate this yoke around X, it's rotating around the X axis of our root assembly, not its own X axis. And you do have the option to choose custom inputs. So I can choose a specific edge to, to translate or rotate about, as well as my own plane to pan across. Now the snap command, what this does is it just sets a temporary coincident constraint. So I can grab the center axis of this yoke and align it to this edge and use this green arrow to toggle the direction or the orientation. And now I say that it's temporary because I can now take that same axis and orient it to another edge without affecting my assembly. It's just for positioning your parts. And once you do position your parts, you set your assembly constraints similar to, you, to how you do in SOLIDWORKS, and you have your commands like coincident, contact, gap, angle, or fix. And you just select your geometries and then align them and set your degrees of freedom accordingly. And once you do that, in SOLIDWORKS, based off of your degrees of freedom, you can grab a part and move it, and it'll, your mechanism will work as expected. Once again, in CATIA, you have to define that a little, you have to define your direction and parts you're moving a little bit more. So we can't just drag and move our parts. However, if we go back into our manipulate command, we can toggle this option here with respect to constraints. And then upon selecting, you know, the appropriate axis to rotate my knob around, I'll select the pin axis and then grab the knob. And we'll see that as I move it, our mechanism now acts accordingly. And keep in mind, uh, in CATIA, if you want to move some data, you have to make sure you have the correct level active. So let's say I wanted to move this pin independent of the rest of its subassembly. If I went to manipulate, I went to go move this pin, we'll see that it's actually going to move my entire subassembly. So what I need to do is I need to double click that subassembly in order to move anything that's below it. 
So now we'll see. I can move this pin or this knob independent, independent of its subassembly. And one final note, Katia has the ability to uh, use clash detection. So once again, in our move toolbar, we have our stop manipulate on clash. And as long as that's activated, I can do clash detection. So I go back into manipulate and I need to have stop manipulate on clash activated as well as with respect to constraints activated. You'll see as I move this pin back, we'll notice that once it collides, that we can't move the pin past this crank arm as well as the crank arm is now highlighted as the part that it's interfering with. And that's all I have for now while still allowing some time for questions. With that being said, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. If you don't think of any now, but think of some later, please feel free to email me and I will be happy to answer your questions afterwards. And also if I get enough questions, uh, I'll gladly create a follow-up video in which I address these and perhaps even turn this into a series. So with that being said, thank you for watching. And once again, my name is Tim Ramos with Go Engineer, and I hope to see you all again for another webinar in the future. So one of the questions, what is, what is called the component sets used for this webinar demo? So are you talking about the, the U-joint assembly or you know, when you say what is, what is, let me share the SOLIDWORKS file of the assembly. Sure, yeah. Um, if you want me to send over the, the SOLIDWORKS file assembly as well as the CATIA file, uh, just email me and I can, uh, I can send that data over to you. Absolutely. And let's Kayla, if you know there's a way to uh, add data into this webinar uh, that they can download. And then I have a question regarding, uh, can I create a sketch-based stamp? Do you mean, when you say stamp, you do have the option, let's see here. Hmm, let's see. I think there's a way that you can input text, if I recall correctly. Um, is that what you mean by stamp or? And yeah, Robert, maybe we'll maybe we'll follow up and uh, determine what you mean by uh, sketch-based stamp. And I'd be yeah happy to go over what whichever you mean by that. Uh, I had questions about SolidWorks having configurations in assembly. What would be your implementing something in Katia? 
Hmm. You know, you can set variants on uh, on parts. I have to look into the the configurations in Katia. That might be a little something something that's integrated with both, because that would depend on both your local file file system if you're using a local file system or if you're using Anovia. I know Anovia allows you to choose different variants, and it'll give you different variants within your tree. Um, but if you're opening from if you're opening from local, um, I need to I need to look into that, Cassandra. Do I have two D drawings of the components parts with dimensions for me to create components in SolidWorks? Um, I could try and get those for you. Uh, I don't have them out of the box. I would have to either find the find and see if those uh, 2D drawings are available, or I can create them for you so you can make them yourself. Um, so yeah, if, um, I can follow up with you and I can I can get those to you. And yeah, all these uh, also all these questions are being logged, so I can um, I can reach out to you uh, post this web after this webinar and actually give kind of a more detailed response. So Katia V5 on its, uh, the question is, does Katia V5 have CAM functionality? Uh, so that's more uh, an extension of Katia V5, if you will. Um, that's going to be more within Delmia or CamWorks. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a separate program, but it does allow you to, um, it does a lot of allow you to convert your data or export your data in a, in a cam friendly format. So you can, uh, write those, uh, CNC paths and all that stuff. So yeah, you can, you know, you can't write the cam, uh, the cam code. The CNC code in Katia, but uh, it will export to a, a file type that you know will allow you to uh, write that write that code in the appropriate program. What is the email contact contact about the inquiry about? Um, are you asking about my email? It's right there, tremos at goengineer.com.
Yeah, going back. Oh. Use prismatic machine work. Hit those created using just using Del Media. So, uh, as far as it's, it's hard to talk about, or it's hard to talk to how uh, the capabilities of using Delmia as opposed to the Prismatic Machining Workbench. Um, but it does, you know, the Prismatic Machining Workbench, it allows you to do uh, 2.5 axis milling and drilling, um, and then uh, allows you to. It does allow you to cover the whole manufacturing process from like tool trajectory to NC code. Uh, so it's, you know, you're gonna get, um, you're gonna get um, a more of a robust output with with, uh, with Dalmia. But uh, the, prism, the pr prismatic machining workbench, um, yes, yeah, it, it, it's gonna be for more simple parts as opposed to uh, what Delmia will offer. But um, yeah, for at least like simple machine parts, prismatic uh, machining should get you through. And I'll be able to go a few minutes over. I know we're we're past the end of the webinar, but yeah, I can go a few minutes over. Now, I do have a hard stop at 2 p.m. Mountain, but I'll stay up for a little bit longer. And yeah, Cassandra, looks like I did a little bit of looking into it. It looks like, yeah, configurations at the assembly level, um, there isn't necessarily a feature for that. Um, yeah, if you're using Innovia, it can handle configurations, um, but usually it's just gonna be based off of your, your local file system and having those configurations kind of se sequestered off. Um, I'll think on that though, uh, that might be an entire webinar on its own. Um, there might, I'll have to think about what's a good method or what the be best practice is to, to handle that if you're using your local file system. All right, it looks like there's no more uh, questions coming through. So if you do have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me once again at tramos at goengineer.com. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day.